Hi everyone, I'm Mark Brady and I'm studying engineering management at Trinity and I got a H1 in my physics leaving cert and I'm going to take you through the higher level 2020 physics paper, question two specifically. This question is a mandatory experiment on optics. It's worth a total of 40 marks and yeah, let's get straight into it. So in question two, we are told about this experiment using the refractive index of glass. And what we're told here is that we're going to be passing light through a glass block and you're going to be measuring angle for incidence and an angle for refraction. We're also given a table here as standard. We're going to be given different angles for I, which is our angle of incidence, and different angles here for OR, which is our angle of refraction. In part I, we were asked to explain how the refracted ray and the angle of refraction were determined. And it says here that a label diagram may help your answer. Now, personally, the way I'd always tackle this type of question is drawing a label diagram. I always find it easier to use the label diagram to kind of structure my final answer because these types of questions want you to write a small paragraph explaining the important pieces of this diagram. Here, I've drawn a small label diagram that I'm just going to use to get a good idea of what the question is asking. And um, just some notable things to go through in the diagram. And um, the dotted line in the background is just going to be the piece of paper or the sheet which the glass block is based on. The glass block itself is outlined in this kind of plum color uh, here as well. And using another key things to note about this is we have a small ray box here in the bottom which is going to have a uh, ray passing out of it. It's going to go into the glass block. It's going to uh, refract, and then it's going to come out the other side. As well as this, I have also marked in a few of the angles. This is just helps me to keep track of kind of which angle is which. And um, the angle I here beside the ray box is our angle of incidence, and the angle OR on the other side is our angle of refraction. As well as this, we have several pins marked in as well. These are kind of used to trace out the beam uh, and how it strikes the paper. And the reason that we need this is we need this later on for um, using a protractor to measure the angles of instance and the angle of refraction. Now that we've had a look through the diagram, we're going to now tackle the question head on, which is explaining how the refracted ray and the angle of refraction were actually determined. So as I said earlier, we're going to be using a protractor, but the method shown below is the kind of standard protocol to this question. And it says by using a ray box and pins, the laser passing through the ray can be mapped. We can then trace the block onto a piece of paper and draw in the normal. Finally, we can measure the angle of instance and the angle of refraction in the glass block by using a protractor. So what this means basically is once we've placed the glass block down on our piece of paper, we trace it around with a pencil and then we take our ray box and we fire a ray into the glass. Once we've passed a ray through the glass, we use pins to map out this ray. Then what we do is remove all of the hardware, just leaving a piece of paper with our trace block and several pins in it. Then we trace the line here for the ray through the pins into the glass block and out the other side. And then what we use is our protractor to calculate the angle of instance and the angle of refraction, as we said earlier. This part of the question was worth a total of nine marks, and it's a great place to pick up marks because this is just a straightforward definition that comes up every time. It's a very easy thing to pick up marks with. So as I was saying, it's worth a total of nine marks, and this was broken down into three sets of three marks. You got three marks for mentioning that you have to use a ray box and a laser in order to determine the angle. So we're going to put a three up here. You also need three marks for mentioning that there is a normal drawn at the point of incidence, which is just going to be marked here. And finally, you get another three marks for stating that the angle between the normal and the ray in the block is actually measured with a protractor, which we have here. And if you get all these right, you get your total of nine marks for this question, which is, as I said earlier, a perfect place to pick up marks. In part two here, we're asked, why would using a smaller angle of incidence have led to a less accurate measurement of the angle of refraction? On the left here, we have our kind of just a quick diagram of what's going on in the question. And um, we have our glass block and we have our ray passing through it. So on one side of the glass block, we have our angle of incidence as the ray passes into the glass block. And on the other side, when the ray is kind of uh, refracted, we have our um, angle of refraction as well. So looking back at our question, we're asked, why would using a smaller angle of incidence have led to a less accurate measure um, for the angle of refraction? And it goes as follows. As we are measuring the angle to the nearest degree using a protractor, and as this angle of incidence decreases, the denominator that we are using here to find this um, error also decreases while the numerator stays constant. This means is as the denominator gets smaller um, in a fraction, it means that the uh, overall fraction gets bigger. and 
instances is the error term. As this gets bigger, it causes the error itself to get bigger. So if you can think about it like that, as the angle of instance, which is going to be on the bottom half of this fraction, um, for the error is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. This is going to cause the overall fraction to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And that means that the error overall grows. So this part of the question is worth a total of six marks. And it was broken down as follows. You got three marks for talking about this smaller angle um, and actually decreasing this angle of instance. And you got a final three marks for measuring that there's a greater percentage error, which in this case comes from the fact that as the angle of instance decreases, it's the denominator of the fraction, which causes the overall fraction to get bigger, therefore creating a larger percentage of error. In part three, we are asked to use the data given to us in the above question to verify Snell's law. And the first thing here is to identify what Snell's law. And if you can't remember, Snell's law is that the sine of the angle of instance I is directly proportional to the sine of the angle of refraction or. And basically, this means that we need to plot sine I versus sine or in order to verify Snell's law. What you may notice at the start of the question is we are given a table of the angles of instance and the angles of refraction seen in this table here on the right. Now, this is all good data that we can use, but we must convert this to the sine of the angle of instance and the sine of the angle of refraction. Because as we know, Snell's law is the sine of I is directly proportional to the sine of or. Therefore, we must convert this above table into this second table here. This is simply done by putting in every angle into your calculator and calculating the sine of it. So, for example, if you wanted to calculate the angle 30 degrees, all you have to do is put sine of 30 degrees into your calculator and you get 0 0.5. And this is where this number comes from. You repeat this for every angle given in the table, 30 degrees, 40 degrees, and all of the angles of instance, and repeat this for all of the angles of refraction. This then gives us x and y coordinates for our data that we can plot on our graph. As we said earlier, Snell's law says that the sine of i is directly proportional to the sine of or. What this means is that we're going to plot sine i versus sine or. And in this case, we're going to put sine i on the y-axis and sine or on the x-axis. As we can see in the graph on the left, here we have our sine of the angle of instance, which is going to be on our y-axis, and our sine of the angle of refraction, which is going to be on our x-axis. And using all of the data given in the new converted set, sine i, sine or, we can then plot each of these points as we see here in this plum color on our graph. And what you're going to have is in total you will have six points because there are six pieces of data, one, two, three, four, five, and six. And what you want to do is once you've done this, you want to plot your line of best fit. In this case, the line of best fit goes directly through the origin, and the majority of these points should lie basically on this line with a slight variation to either side, depending on how accurate your graph is. By doing this, we thereby verify Snell's law, as on the left we have sine i, and on the right we have sine or, and we have a straight line graph going through the origin, meaning that these two are directly proportional, and therefore we have completed the question. Part 3 was worth a total of 12 marks, and you got 3 marks for labelling your axes of the graph correctly. Now, I can't overstate the importance of labelling your graph correctly, and this is, you know, following all the steps that you normally would, giving it a title, labelling the axes, and giving the units that's measured in is also an important thing. And also, when you're plotting your data points, I always find it's good to draw a circle around them so that it makes it obvious to the examiner where they are, because if you're using only one coloured pen in the exam, they might get, you know, difficult to see. Also, drawing your line of best fit, it's important to try and get as many of the points as close to the line as possible. Another three marks are going for the six points that we plotted on the line. Another three points were going for the straight line with a good fit, which we have here in our purple. This is your line of best fit. And your final three marks were for, of course, doing the correct conversion for all of the angles of I and the angles of OR into their respective sign values. This gives us our total of 12 marks. In part four, we're asked to explain how this graph verifies Snell's law. And as I said earlier, we kind of touched on how it does this, but I've written out a small kind of more detailed answer explaining this. And this is kind of what you're expected to do in the exam as well. So what I have here is that the above graph has a straight line that goes to the origin. This means that sine i is proportional to sine or with a constant slope, which is the refractive index of the material. In this case, it would be the refractive index for glass. Now, the last bit there saying that this is the refractive index for glass isn't necessarily required, but it's just kind of a good thing to help the examiner understand that you know what you're talking about. 
as we see in the above graph, we have uh, we had a line that goes straight through the origin, but it also is a straight line. It doesn't bend or anything like that. Uh, and this does mean that sine i in this case, which I'll represent mathematically, sine i is proportional to sine of four. And as we said in the formula above, in this case, the ratio of these two together is going to give us a constant known as the refractive index, which we marked as n in the above equation. And yeah, this is a constant, as I said earlier, for the material that you're using. So glass, water, air. And in the last line here, we're just explaining that, that it's the refractive index of glass because the light ray is actually passing into the glass and it is then being refracted. So this is a, it's a lovely question because it's purely theory, which means um, if you understand the question and understand kind of the concepts behind it, it's very easy to pick up these marks. There were six marks going for this question. You got three marks of saying that there was a straight line graph, which we have here. And you got another three marks for saying that it goes through the origin, which I have down here. In part five, we were asked to use the graph to calculate the refractive index of the glass in the question. To do this, we must go back to our Snell's law. As we said earlier, the sine of the angle of instance i is directly proportional to the sine of the angle of refraction, or this can be rearranged and a constant can be brought in to get rid of that proportional sign to give us our calculation or a formula for finding the angle of refraction. From here, we can bring in a constant and rearrange to get our formula for finding the refractive index of a material. Our refractive index, known as n, is given as the sine of the angle of instance i divided by the sine of the angle of refraction, or. Looking at our graph on the left, what we can see is that we have sine i on our y-axis and sine or on our x-axis. This means that if we calculate the slope of the line, in this case the line of best fit, we'll be able to find the refractive index of the glass used in the question. Just a note to make about the refractive index, the refractive index of a material is directly corresponding to that material. This means that it changes based on the material and only on the material. So for example, the refractive index of air is different to the refractive index of water, is different to the refractive index of diamond, for example. We are now going to calculate the refractive index of the glass in this question using our formula that we found earlier. As we said earlier, the slope of our graph is going to give us the refractive index of the glass in this question. What that means is we have to find the slope. If you can't remember how to find the slope of a line, the best way to do it is just go straight to your log tables and look in the coordinate geometry section on page 18. Here we find that the slope of a line given as PQ is given as M is equal to Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. This means that if we have two points along our line, we're able to calculate the slope of the graph PQ. And we're going to use this now to find the refractive index of the glass in this question. Using the formula we found earlier, we said that the slope of our graph, in this case M, I'm going to say for the slope of our graph, is Y2 minus Y1 all over X2 minus X1. Now we have to be careful in choosing our points along the graph. Some people might find it easier to just take the points directly from the data that we were given, and this is incorrect. What we need to do is look at our line and pick points that are on our line of best fit. This gives us a better idea of what the refractive index of the material actually is. A hint here is to always look at the origin of our graph. The reason that we want to look at the origin of our graph is here we can see it starts at zero, zero. This means that if we set one of the points to be our origin, or 0, 0, all we have to look for is one other point that is a bit more difficult to find. By looking at 0, 0, it means that there's less inaccuracies in trying to find out the exact point along our graph on this line of best fit. On the right here, I'm going to write out the two points that we're going to use so we don't get confused. What we're going to have is point 1, which I said is going to be our origin. Reason again is because it's just the simplest point to use, and that's at 0, 0. And we now need to determine a second point along our line of best fit to use. What we're going to do is we're going to look, and personally I always find it easier to find where the line crosses between two boxes on our graph. It just is easier to measure because they tend to be whole numbers. So if you want to look along our graph, we're going to determine a point now. I'm going to use this point up at the very top. The reason is by having a point at the start and at the end, you get a good average for the line of best fit. By having two points that are very close together, you can lose a bit of that accuracy. And by doing it this way, you end up getting a slightly more accurate answer. What we now need to do is determine the coordinates of this point. If we draw a dotted line down to our x and to our y axis, what we can see is that the coordinates of this point at the very end of our line is going to be roughly... 0 0.7 on our x-axis, and as well as that, it's going to be about 1.05 on our y-axis. 
And what we're going to do now is write this over here on our right hand side. So we're going to have our x axis going first, so it's going to be 0 0.7. And on the y, we're going to have 1.05. Now we're going to fill in our formula to find the slope of our graph. What we need to do is label these points on the right hand side as x1, x2, y1, y2, so we don't get confused when we're subbing it in. What we will do is we will set x1 and y1 to be our points for the origin, and we're going to have x2 and y2 for our points for the point on the end of the line. And what we're going to do now is just simply sub this into our formula. So for y2, we're going to have 1.05 minus 0 all over x2, which is 0 0.7, minus 0 as well. And simply put, all we have to do is put this into our calculator. So we're going to get 1.05 all over 0 0.7, as the zeros don't count towards anything. If we put this directly into our calculator, what we will find is that the slope of this line is 1.5. Now, with these questions, because you're plotting a graph and you're determining your own line of best fit, you have a little bit of breathing space either side of 1.5, but around 1.5 is the generally accepted right answer. This question was worth a total of seven marks and was broken down as follows. You got three marks for correctly writing down the formula for the slope of the line. You got two marks for correctly substituting these points that we had on our graph into the line. And you got a final two marks for correctly getting an answer in and around 1.5, which we did just over here. So you got another two marks here. And this gives us our total of seven marks for this question.